pray. Dear God, we are so thankful for your son, Jesus Christ, who gives us new life, through whom we can say, God, that we have been crucified with your son like Paul. And it's not we who live, but it's you who live in us. What an incredible reality, God, that you have saved us, you have given us of your righteousness, you have given us of life through your Son, Jesus Christ. And that's what we want. We want to put off the sins of the flesh. We want to put on your righteousness, continually grow in the grace and knowledge of your Son, Jesus Christ. Dear God, I pray that as we walk through your word, that you would speak that you would fill our mind and heart with what you want us to know. Pray, God, you would convict us of any and all sin. And I pray, God, you would move us to confess that sin. That you would forgive like you are faithful always to do. Forgive us of all that sin. And in response, we would love you all the more. Dear God, we God, love you. We, love you. we, ask, we ask that you continue, continue to work, to work and that we continue to praise your name through the preaching of your word. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Please turn to Nehemiah chapter 9. Good morning, Bill. As you're turning there, let me say this. There is a beautiful hymn called... More love to thee, O Christ. Listen closely to the opening lyrics. It reads, more love to thee, O Christ. More love to thee. Hear thou the prayer I make on bended knee. This is my earnest plea. More love, O Christ, to thee. More love to thee. More love to thee. When a non-Christian, when a non-Christian is convicted of their sin, confesses their sin and trust in Jesus Christ as their Lord and risen Savior, what happens? The blood of Jesus Christ cleanses them from all unrighteousness. They are forgiven of all of their sin. They are rescued from the hell that they deserve. They are filled with God, the Holy Spirit. They are adopted into the family of God, and they are given everlasting life. Amen? And out of thankfulness, and out of thankfulness for the life-saving, life-giving love of Christ, that person is then motivated and moved by the Holy Spirit to do what? Out of thankfulness for what Christ has done, they are moved and motivated to love Christ in return. The cry of their life becomes all the more every day, more love to thee, O Christ, more love to thee, or as we just sang, Christ be magnified. That is the result of the love of Christ. It is a changed heart that cries, more love to thee. When a believer is convicted of their sin, when a believer is convicted of their sin, confesses their sin, and trusts in Jesus Christ to cleanse them from all their unrighteousness, they are cleansed. Amen? Gone is the guilt, the fear, and the shame that that sin has brought. And in comes the all-surpassing peace, the all-surpassing rest, and the all-surpassing, all-conquering joy of the Lord. And in response to all that God has done, not to earn anything, but just to say thank you with their life, that person then does what? They experience the love of Christ. And in return, out of thankfulness, they say, I love you. I love you, God. More love to thee, O Christ.
Christ more love to thee. When a person genuinely experiences the love of Jesus, it motivates them and they are empowered by the Holy Spirit to love Jesus in return. And what, and what does that love for Jesus look like? What does it consist of? What does it mean to love Jesus in return? It means at least five things. One, it means to trust Jesus above all else. To look into his word, to see the words of Jesus and say, amen, it is so. That's what amen means. It means it is so. It is truth. Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. Everything you have said and done is reality. It is truth. I trust in you and what who you are and what you've done. To love Jesus is to trust him. To love Jesus in return also is to praise him above all else. To praise him above all else. In Jeremiah chapter 10, verse 6, it says, There is none like you, O Lord. Jeremiah speaking. You are great, and your name is great in might. A person who loves Jesus out of the thankfulness of their heart for all that he has done trust Jesus, they praise Jesus, they also prioritize Jesus above everything else. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 37 and 38, whoever loves father or mother more than me, Jesus is not worthy of me. And whoever loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And whoever does not take up his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. We can recite the greatest commandment. The first and the greatest, Jesus says, is what? To love the Lord their God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The person who loves God trusts God, trusts in Jesus, praises Jesus, prioritizes Jesus, and they also desire Jesus above all else. King David said in Psalm 63, 1, O God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My flesh faints for you. As in a dry and weary land where there is no water. What did the Apostle Paul say? He said in Philippians 1.23, My desire, my desire is to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. The person who has experienced the love of Jesus Christ, their heart is changed and formed, and all they want to do is say, more love to thee, O Christ. May the life song, my, my life song be more love to thee. And they do that through trust, praise, prioritizing Jesus, and desiring Jesus. And the last one is obeying Jesus. Jesus said in John 14, 15, if you love me, you will obey me. Jesus said in John 14, 21, whoever, whoever has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. 1 John 5, 3 says, for this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not burdensome. When a person has experienced the love of Jesus Christ, whether it's an unbeliever becoming a believer or a believer being forgiven, cleansed of their unrighteousness, what always happens as a result? What's a genuine sign that they have genuinely been experienced or genuinely experienced the love of Jesus? They are moved and motivated by the Holy Spirit to love Jesus in return, to live a life of love to him that trusts him, praises him, prioritizes him, desires him, and obeys him. Now with that truth in mind, with that truth in our minds, what did we see last week in Nehemiah chapter 9? We saw the whole nation of Israel Open up the sword of the Spirit. Open up the Word of God. And what happened? The sword pierced their heart. They're convicted of their sin. 
And then they confess their sin. Look at Nehemiah chapter 9, verse 4. And they stood up in their place and read from the book of the law of the Lord. Their God for a quarter of the day. For another quarter they made confession and worshiped the Lord, their God. And then we saw last week that the rest of the chapter is the content of their confession and the content of this praise. And what are we going to see this week? We're going to see the people of God out of thankfulness for his love, out of thankfulness for his mercy, out of thankfulness for his abundant grace that he has showered, continually showered upon them and his forgiveness. We're going to see them do what? They've experienced the love of Christ and now they're going to love God. They're going to love him out of thankfulness. They're going to love him in return. They, as we'll see later in the text, what are they going to do? They're going to make a commitment. They're going to sign a document. The whole nation's going to gather behind this. They're going to make a love commitment to God. Specifically, they are going to love God or strive to love God by obeying every law, by obeying every detail. Not to earn anything, but because they have received grace, they love God in return. First, we see the signers of this covenant. Look at verse 38 of chapter 9. Verse 38 of chapter 9. The signers of this love commitment. Because of all of this, because of the grace and mercy extended to them, because they are the redeemed people of God, forgiven of their sin, because of all of this, we make a firm covenant in writing. On the sealed document are the names of the princes, our Levites, and our priests. So the people of God have been convicted of their sin. They've confessed their sin. They've been graciously cleansed of their sin because God is always faithful and just to forgive all of those who confess. And here they're signing a, a text says, firm covenant, a serious commitment, as we'll see later, to love God through obedience, to love God in return. Then starting in chapter 10, verse 1, it begins to list all of the names. It begins to list all of the leaders who sign this love commitment to God. And I hate to disappoint you, but I'm not going to read all of those names. We have the list of all of these leaders. Then starting in verse 28, what do we see? It tells us that the entire nation of Israel join in on this love commitment. That it's not just the leaders telling the people what to do. But this is a love commitment that includes every man, every woman, every child in Israel. They've all heard the word, they've confessed their sin, they've been forgiven of their sin, and now they're all making a love commitment to God. Look at verse 28. The rest of the people, the priests, the Levites, the gatekeepers, the singers, the temple servants, and all who have separated themselves from the peoples of the land to the law of God, their wives, their sons, their daughters, and all who have knowledge and understanding, meaning little kids who can speak and be spoken to and have some semblance of understanding, join with the brothers and nobles. So at the beginning of chapter 9, as we saw last week, the people gather together. They read the sword of the Spirit. It pierces their heart. They confess their sin. They're forgiven of their sin, cleansed from their unrighteousness. And here they are making a commitment in response to that. Not to get anything, not to earn anything, but to say, I love you, thank you, God. Now let's look at the general content of this love commitment. There's a general statement in verse 29. It starts, they entered into a curse. This entire nation, they enter into a curse and an oath to walk in God's law that was given by Moses, the servant of God, and to observe and do all the commandments of the Lord, our Lord, and his rules and his statutes. Now I want to clarify three things here. 
Let's first clarify the curse. Verse 29 says they, as a whole nation, enter into a curse. What does that mean? It means that all of these people did not sign up for this love commitment blindly, that there was no small wording that anyone missed, that everyone knew exactly what they were doing, that they realized that by entering into this commitment, if they were to break this commitment and break the law of God, there would be consequences just like before. They understand that. There's going to be discipline of God if they break if they fall away again, it's like, it's like when Kimberly and I made our marriage vows. Prior to saying them, the pastor who performed the ceremony, Pastor Mike Royals, in premarital counseling and on the wedding day, right before we made the vows, what did he say? He said, John. If you you break break these marriage marriage vows, not only are you sinning against God, not only are you going to sin against Kimberly, Kimberly, but there there will be consequences. consequences. There will will be discipline. discipline. You're a child of God, and God cares for you so much that when you enter into the wrong path, he will discipline you. Keep your vows. The people here, they're making a love commitment to God. They're making a love commitment to God, to walk in his ways, to do all of his commandments. And they're not going into it blindly. They understand if they disobey, there's consequences. There's discipline from God. Not because God is so evil, but because God is so loving, just, and good. That he will bring those who fall straight back. So with that clarified, now let's clarify another aspect of this commitment. This is not work for salvation. The next one we're going to clarify is this is not legalism. Let's start with the first. This is not work for salvation. In other words, theologically, this is not a covenant of works. This is not the Israelites saying, if we obey, we'll earn God's favor. Or if we obey, we'll pay for our sins. Or if we obey, we're going to get into heaven. No. They've already already been. been. Remember what happened in chapter 9? They've already been convicted. They've already been or already confessed, and they've already been forgiven. They are the people of God. So it's out of thankfulness. It's saying, this is who we are. This is what you made us. This is the grace and mercy you've given us. We want to love you in return. We want to love you the way you tell us to love you. By following your commands, by seeking to obey you in everything. So this is not a covenant of works, as in working for one's salvation. You could call this a covenant of thanksgiving. Because of your grace and mercy, I want to live for you in every way. This is not legalistic. These people here, wanting to obey every part of God's law, wanting to do everything in it to the utmost degree. That is not legalistic. Some have a tendency to think that a commitment to obedience, that striving to obey, that an all-out determination, independence on the Holy Spirit to follow every word of God is somehow legalistic. It's not. person with this mindset might say we should just rest in our salvation and not strive to firmly commit or firmly commit to obeying our Savior every day. Just rest in your salvation. Don't feel the need to obey. That is garbage. Let me say it this way. Kimberly and I, we are married. Just imagine if I said to her, Kimberly, we're married. I'm going to rest in that. I'm going to rest in our marriage. And as a result, I feel no need to strive in any way to love you more and more. Do we have a deal? (laughs) You realize this? What I should be saying is, Kimberly, because we're married, because 
because you lowered yourself and married me. Because we're married, out of thankful joy, I'm going to strive all the more to love you more and more every day. Right? Did I get it right? Yes. <laughs> the same thing is happening here. They've been forgiven. They are the people of God. They're not earning anything. They've already got everything in God. Now out of thankfulness, they're saying in every way possible, we are going to strive to obey you. Because obedience, as your son Jesus says, is how we love you. So we're going to love you, God. We're going to strive. What does 1 Peter chapter 3 say? Be holy. That's a command. Be holy, God says, for I am holy. He wants us to be something. So out of love, we strive in dependence upon the Holy Spirit because we're saved to obey him, to love him, to be holy. So what is happening here is not a covenant of works. It is not legalism. Now let's move to the last section of this passage. And it's the specific focuses it's the specific commands within all the commands that they're striving to obey. They mention these specifics because these are some specifics that they've really struggled with. The nation of Israel, these specifics we're going to look at, they really struggle with them. So they're making a love commitment to God. We're going to obey you out of love. And we know we've struggled in these few areas in particular. So we're really committing ourselves by the power of your spirit to live this way. Live the way you've called us to live. And what is the first specific focus that they have? No intermarriage with pagans. Look at verse 30. We will not give our daughters to the peoples of the land. In other words, everyone who is not of the people of God, not believers. We will not give our daughters to the people of the land or take their daughters for our sons. Now, it's important to realize in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 3, God, through Moses, commanded the people to do what? Deuteronomy 7, verse 3, God says, through Moses, you shall not intermarry with them, non-Israelites who don't believe in God, giving your daughters to their sons or taking their daughters for your sons. Now, why in the world would God give a command like that? We don't have to speculate. God tells us why. In the next verse, in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 4, God through Moses says, For they, speaking of the unbelieving spouse, for they would turn your sons from following me to serve other gods. Then the anger of the Lord would be kindled against you, and he would destroy you quickly. In other words, the Israelites... The people of God, chosen, saved by grace through faith. And when they enter into a marital relationship who does not have that salvation by grace through faith, a.k.a. pagan, what happens? The individual they have married brings about influence in their life. And that influence is not good. It does not direct them more and more to God. It directs them away from God. We see this all over the Old Testament, right? All over the place, right? Samson and Delilah. Delilah really drew Samson closer to God. Amen? Don't say amen. <laughs> Solomon, with all of his many pagan, non-believing wives, it did not help him in the slightest. They drew him away from God. So God has told the Israelites, hey, not because I am a killjoy, but to protect you from going astray, don't marry outside the people of God. You've seen already, and here are the people, what are they doing? They've been convicted by the word, they've confessed the word, they're wanting now to love Jesus, to love God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit by following that. So they're making a commitment to do this. And by the way, this same command, for the same reason, is given in the New Testament. In 1 Corinthians, what do we see? Concerning believers, he tells us not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. A.K.A. Do not marry an unbeliever. 
And to that one may say, well, you just don't know my fiancé. He's or she's an exception to the rule. Or to that a person may say, well, you just don't know. I'm stronger than Samson. I'm more wiser than Solomon. You just don't know me, God. Or to that a person may say, well, I can do the job of the Holy Spirit on my spouse. I'll save them. None of that is true. That's all false. God knows best. He doesn't give us rules to push us down. He gives us rules to lift us up, to enable us to live a life that's worth living that shouts more love to you. You have loved me. I will love you. Just like it was hard for the Israelites, just like it's hard for us today, we struggle with this command concerning marriage. The Israelites, you know, I've mentioned it, they broke it, they broke it often. But this is them saying, hey, I know we struggled with this command. I know it's been hard for us. There's elements that we don't understand and pretend to know. But God, you have loved me more than I can ever, more than I ever deserve. And out of thankfulness, I will love you. I will obey, I will strive, strive to obey you. Now let's look at the next specific command in regards to keeping the Sabbath. Look at verse 31. And if the peoples of the land bring in goods or any grain on the Sabbath day to sell, we will not buy from them on the Sabbath or a holy day, and we will forego crops in the seventh year and the exaction of every debt. So in Old Testament, God tells them to rest on the Sabbath. Do no physical labor. He also tells them every seventh year to let the land rest. He also tells them every 49th year to forgive all debts, no matter how great they are. You guys owe my money, 49th year comes around, your year of Jubilee, I am called to forgive all of them. You owe me nothing. All that's contained within the Sabbath laws. And there's two primary reasons that God gives us all these Sabbath laws. First is to remind us of God's creative process. How God created everything in six days and then rested on the seventh. So the command of the Sabbath is all pointing to the greatness of God, first and foremost. Second, the Sabbath also points to Jesus Christ. The Sabbath is given, Hebrews tells us, and it calls it a shadow of things to come. It points points to Christ. Christ. How so? so? Well, Well, Jesus Jesus is the one who, like we rest physically, or they rested physically on the Sabbath, who provides rest. rest. Come to me, all who are weary, and I will give you rest. Just like they were supposed to allow the land to rest every seven years and trust in God's provision, the provision of God amplified in that manner, Jesus Jesus is the provider. provider. He's the provider of all we need. He's the Savior. Just like every 49 or 70 years, a little debate there, you're supposed to forgive all the debts of others. That all points to who? It points to Jesus, who forgives the greatest debt, our sin debt. So God has given these laws not to be a pain in the neck, but to point to an incredible reality, who God is and who the Savior is. And here, these Israelites, they have been horrible at keeping the Sabbath. It's one of the things you read of the history of Israel. It's the quickly forgotten command. It's the quickly disobeyed command. Yet here, they've experienced the love of Jesus. They're changed and renewed. So they say, we have new vigor and motivation to love you through obedience. And just think of the cost, right? They're losing a day of work to their competition. Every week. week. They're They're losing losing a year of crop crop every seven seven years. years. They're They're losing losing the exaction of debt. debt. They're They're losing, 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 right? There's a cost to obeying these things, but they say it doesn't matter. God, you have loved us. We want to love you in the way in which you told us to love you. The last one we have here is to give to the Lord's work. And they do this in varying ways. The last specific focus. Look at verse 32. 
We also take on ourselves the obligation to give yearly a third part of a shekel for the service of the house of our God, for the showbread, the regular grain offering, the regular burnt offerings, the Sabbaths, the new moons, the appointed feasts, the holy things, and the sin offerings to make atonement for Israel and for the work of the house of the Lord. Then in verse 32, it talks about the wood offerings. Then it talk, in verses 35 through 39, it talks about the fruit, the first fruit offerings, that they're all committing themselves to giving. Look at the last line of the chapter. It says, we will not neglect the house of God. The house of Israel was famous for neglecting the house of God. Yet here they've been convicted, they've confessed, they've been forgiven, and out of thankfulness they say, we are going to strive, we are going to strive to obey. Because you first loved us, we will love you in return, God. So we've seen the signers of the commitment, we've seen the general content, and we've looked at some specifics that they struggle with that they're really focusing in on. Application number one in light of what we've seen in God's word, get into the sword of the spirit. The sword of the spirit is God's word. It is what has pricked these people's heart. It is what has convicted them. It is what the Holy Spirit has utilized to enable them to confess and then be inspired and moved to live according to God's word. And we need to take an example from them, take a hint from them and say, we get into the sword of the spirit because we know his word, like in this text, does not return void. It always produces. So the encouragement for us today as we see is get into the sword of the spirit. And lastly, like we see these people, we need to love Jesus by obeying Jesus. Love Jesus by obeying Jesus. Not to earn anything because we can't. Not to pay for sins because we can't. But to say thank you unto God like he deserves. Like he is worthy of. I want to read a poem. It's going to be on the screen. It shouts this truth. It really struck me this week. It says, oh, the bitter shame and sorrow that a time could ever be when I let the Savior's pity plead in vain and priorly answered all of self, not to thee. Yet he found me, I beheld, bleeding on the cursed tree, heard him pray, Forgive them, Father, and some wistful heart, and my wistful heart said faintly, some of self and some of thee. Day by day, his tender mercy, healing, helping, full and free, sweet and strong and ah, so patient, brought me lower while I whispered less of self and more of thee. Higher than the highest heavens, deeper than the deepest sea, Lord. Thou, or thy love, at last hath conquered. Grant me now my supplication, none of self and all of thee. That's what's happening in this passage. These people have seen their sin, been convicted and confessed, and they're saying none of self all of thee, all to thee. More love to thee, O Christ. More love to thee. And this is something we need to strive. You know, there's a sign in town that says, Be yourself with Jesus. That's wrong. The word of God does not call us to be yourself and tag on Jesus into our life. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, no longer me, 
but Christ who lives in me. It's none of self. Don't be yourself. It's not about you or me, it's about him. None of self, all of thee. None of self, all of thee. Think about where you're at today. As I am shattered by where I'm at today. (laughs) And ask God by his good graces to forgive, be cleansed and empowered to live. None of self, all of thee. Let's pray. God, thank you for loving us. When we were unlovable, and then making us new, and empowering us through your Holy Spirit to love you in return. That's a life worth living, God. Thank you so much. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.